Well, if you have a child here who hasn't left, um, we have Cornerstone Kids open. We have nursery, which is zero to three-ish. Um, then we have Pebbles, which is three to five. And then I think we have um, Cornerstone Kids open, which is ages six to ten. Everybody else? Y'all stuck with me. Let's uh, go ahead and open up our Bibles to the book of First Peter. If you didn't bring a Bible with you to church today, sorry about that, but we have one provided for you in the pew ahead of you. It is hardback and black. We'll be on page 1016 of that um, Bible. I'd like to welcome everyone to church this morning, as well as our guests from Abundant Life down in Troy. You guys are welcome. Um, thank you for coming today. It's good to see you and worship the Lord together with you. Um, we are um, in the towards the back end of the book of 1 Peter, and we will be working through verses 12 through 19. Lord willing, this morning we should be able to finish up chapter 4 this morning, verses 12 to 19. What I want to do first is to read it together, and then I will pray and uh, we'll get to work. There's a lot of things to do in this passage, and I would like to get to work right away. So with that said, um, verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Peter Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also be glad, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for the judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will, become the out, what will the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I need your help this morning. If there's anything in me that would hinder your word from coming forth clearly and accurately, bring it to my mind. Be gracious that I might repent of it and remove it from me. Should there be anything in my notes which does not accord with your word, I pray, I wouldn't even see it. And if there's something I have forgotten or left out, would you bring it to my mind and speak to your people to glorify your son and to equip them for service while the gospel advances in us and your holy gospel advances through us to the praise of the glory of the grace of our great God and Savior, the great I Am. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning is The File, the Hammer, and the Furnace. It is a phrase that I borrow from Puritan preacher, Pastor Samuel Rutherford. We're going to spend about 45 minutes in this passage and uh, I'll give you five different reasons why I think or five different things you can see in this passage for why we ought to rejoice in suffering. Many ways in the scriptures God teaches us his ordinary manner of working salvation in our souls is to bring us to a place where we are left with no options but to trust Him. Seems to be His pattern to save and sanctify His own. 
Disaster comes, then desperation comes, and then deliverance comes. It seems to be God's way throughout the Bible. For example, God brought a famine. So Jacob's sons would go to their rejected brother in Egypt and get saved. Only to make Israel slaves in Egypt. And then God saves them from the slavery and through Moses brings them deliverance only to bring them into the wilderness where they can't grow crops or find water. So God provides food and provides water and carries them through the wilderness only to bring them to the promised land where they find enemies. And God delivers them from some enemies. And sends others. And then there's a man who's born blind so that Jesus can heal him. And then there's a woman with an issue of blood who spends all of her money on physicians only to have Jesus heal her in an instant. Saul, the great persecutor of the church, becomes Paul, the apostle of the church, only to be afflicted beyond his ability and beaten and stoned and shipwrecked and imprisoned. And the Apostle Peter, writer of this letter, addresses those and calls them elect exiles. So within that very phrase, we see God's chosen people are rejects. God ordained the sequence of events that removed these people the, the, to whom this letter is written from their homeland, made them into unwelcome refugees in some place that is not their home, where they will be marginalized and persecuted, and some of them even killed for his sake. And the Apostle Peter says, don't be surprised by this. This is normative. This is God's way. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul would write of his experience of suffering in Christ, and he would say this, We felt we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You see, friends, The apostles are telling us something that we all must hear and constantly be reminding ourselves of. Because we are extraordinarily forgetful creatures. We are going to suffer. And God is going to deliver us. He's done it before and he will do it again. And we ought not to forget that. We are going to suffer. God is going to deliver us. He's done it before, he'll do it again, and we ought not forget that. You can feel the concern of forgetfulness in the words of Moses. He had brought the people almost to the promised land, and in the book of Deuteronomy, he's, uh, they're, they're literally days away from going into the promised land. And you can feel his concern for them. He says this, This is a selection of Deuteronomy chapter 8. You can read it later. This is what the old man Moses, this is what is on his mind after 40 years in the wilderness with these people. This is what he's thinking about. This is what he's speaking to those people before they go into the promised land. This is what he says. Remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger. So he fed you for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, land of brooks of water and fountains and springs flowing out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God 
When you have eaten and are full and have built houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and then you forget the Lord your God who brought you out out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, who brought you water, who fed you, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Do you feel him saying, remember, don't forget In reality, folks haven't changed all that much in 3,500 years. We live in that time of multiplication. Moses' words, when all have multiplied, are probably more true of us than it was of Israel. We live in a society with greater prosperity than any in the history of the world. And so as we come to 1 Peter 4, verse 12, we read the apostles saying, don't be surprised when fiery trials come upon you to test you. It's not strange. It's God's way of keeping us from forgetting him and trusting in anything else. Sadly, many Christians in the Western world don't have a paradigm for God-ordained suffering. We've been conditioned to believe that our version of Christianity here in the West is the normal version of Christianity, when in reality, our version of Christianity and the safety we experience in the West is not normative. It's not normative historically, and it's not normative globally. Your brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world know exactly what Peter is saying when he speaks of suffering and testing and trial. And we ought to thank God for this time of peace, but we must not take it for granted, and we mustn't let it lull us to sleep For goodness sake, never let your worship of safety become something that keeps you going to the nations for the sake of the gospel. Suffering is ordained by God to cause his people to trust and rely on him and him alone. This is what the scripture teaches. And with that locked securely in your mind, Let's direct our attention to the passage before us. Five reasons why the Apostle Peter says you can be joyful in suffering. Reason number one. It's from our God and for our good. If you're following along in your program on the backside, you can fill that out as we go along. Reason one for joyful suffering. It is from our God and for our good. This comes from verse 12 and verse 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And then verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So suffering is going to come and we shouldn't be surprised when it does because these sufferings that we're experiencing, they are trials. They are meant for our good. And because of this, we should be happy and we should rejoice in trials. God's purpose is to ensure that all that we are trusting our souls to would be Him and Him alone, nothing else. Now, this isn't the first time we've heard this from Peter. If you remember from chapter 1, the opening chapter of this letter, the apostle wrote these words, In this you rejoice. Still on the topic of rejoicing. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith that is tested by fire will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Suffering trials come into your life in order to test the genuineness of your faith, to make sure that it is good. God ordains suffering for his people for this purpose, to reveal the genuineness of faith. In other words, to reveal what we are trusting in. And so if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. Suffering is a trial meant to expose to you your idols. It's likely 
you don't consider yourself an idol worshiper. I, I, probably you think, when you think of idol worshipers, you think people who wear barely any clothes and wear animal bones as jewelry and dance around fires and pray to wooden statues. And that's true, that's idol worship. But an idol is believing, idol worship is anything that we believe will, or anything we have confidence in that will, we hope will give us what we would consider the life that we want. We trust in something in order to bring us the kind of desired outcome of our life. It's anything we trust in other than the Lord Jesus to give us the life we want. And we're all prone to idolatry in a multiple of ways. John Calvin is famous for saying that the human heart is a factory for idols. Colossians 3 calls greed idolatry. God brings crises into our lives to expose our idols. Things that we're trusting in. And I think it's a brilliant method because crisis does have a very unique way of exposing the things that you're trusting in, doesn't it? How would we know we're worshiping money until God takes it away and we despair? How would we know we're trusting in our health until God takes it away and we're desperate for healing? How would we know we're entrusting our souls to safety until our safety is gone? So God brings suffering into our lives to, to reveal our source of hope and our source of joy. And if it is not in Him, He shows us. And by the way, this is tremendous mercy. This is mercy. Because those other things that we're trusting in, they might not be bad things. But they make terrible gods. They might not be sinful things, but they are damning to our souls when we trust in them. Money is good as long as it's used for God's mission. And safety is good if it is used to advance the gospel. And your health is good if when you are healthy, you're serving God's purposes. Those are good things, but they make terrible masters. And so God is too merciful to let his people ruin their lives by trusting in these things. A lot of people, I think, look at the book of Job, if you've read it, and you suppose it's about suffering. And I can see why you would think that, but it isn't about suffering really. The book of Job is really about worship. It's about what Job will worship when he's suffering. If you remember the accusation of the enemy before the Lord, was it not, Job trusts in you, yeah, that's legit, but if you take away his stuff, he ain't going to trust you anymore. So God says, well, take it away then. What is he going to worship when he doesn't have any things? He just likes you for the blessing. Take the blessing away. And then read the last few chapters of that book. You never get an answer to suffering in the book of Job. God never answers I think it's partly because the book isn't really about suffering. It's about worship. And that's why at the end, all God talks about is himself. Job, you need to be worshiping me, not your things. We're so prone to forget God in our prosperity and in our peace and to wonder after idols of comfort and safety and trust in any other thing. But God is too godly and too holy and too kind and too jealous for His own glory to allow us to perish at our own hands. And so He brings the file and the hammer and the furnace 
to expose our idolatry. And these things, though painful, are meant to cut and break and carve us into His image. Which brings us to reason number two. Reason two for joyful suffering. We share in Christ's sufferings. Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering. The reason we have to rejoice in suffering is because when we're so doing, suffering for His sake, we are united with our Lord. God knows when you have nothing left to do but to trust Him, then you are most like your Savior. When all else has failed you, all other gods have found to be false, and all you're left with is your trust in in, in your God alone, that is when you are most like your Savior. And so God will put you there to make you like Jesus. God knows. That's, how, that's, that's what makes us like Jesus. Jesus' sweat-soaked body on the night before his death, when he was facing the threat of excruciating pain on the cross, he warred against the temptation to seek peace over persecution or to seek safety over co- or suffering or to seek comfort over the cross. He warred against that. And our Lord won the victory that night. And he resolved to trust in God alone. And these were his words, among the most important words ever spoken by any person who has ever spoken. It is this, nevertheless, not my will, finish it church, but yours be done. Your Lord won your salvation 2,000 years ago in the middle of the night in a garden when he resolved to trust in his Father above all others because he refused to worship the idol of peace or safety or comfort. And when we submit to God's file and hammer and furnace, we are being carved and cut and broken to be just like Him, to trust the Lord and no other. Rejoicing while sharing in Christ's sufferings might be a strange thing in our ears, but it wasn't a strange thing to the apostles. Acts chapter 5 tells us how they viewed suffering. In Acts chapter 5, God was doing miraculous things through the hands of the apostles in Jerusalem, and it got the attention of the religious elites, and they took Peter and his boys, and they threw them in prison. And that night, they were only in there for a little bit, that night, the angel of the Lord sprung them out, and they went straight back to doing what they were doing. Preaching Jesus in the open. And so they got him again, gathered him up. This time they brought him before council. They threatened them with pain. Don't preach Jesus. Don't preach that name. And they beat him. And sent him away. Acts chapter 5, 41 and 42 records their response. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were found they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name and every day in the temple from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus why would they rejoice in suffering because they were counted worthy to be united with him Our suffering as Christians for the sake of Christ is evidence that we are in Christ. We are united with Him in His life, united with Him in His death. 2 Corinthians 4.11 puts it like this, For we who are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Those words were written by a man who believes the mission of God is bigger than his comfort and his peace and his safety. This was a man who was willing to suffer the loss of all things to make Christ known in the earth. You see, because for the Christian, death is never an end. It is not something we fear. Death is the glorious beginning of real life. 
Romans 14, 8, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. If you kill us, we get Jesus. If you keep us alive, we get Jesus. All Jesus. You can't do anything to us. To live is Christ and die is gain. We are never more like our Savior Savior, than when we are willing to give everything for God and His mission. It is evidence that we are in Him, united. And this, my dear Cornerstone, is reason for great rejoicing. Reason three. Suffering reveals God's glory. This is what it says in the end of verse 13 and in verse 16. Rejoice. And be glad when his glory is revealed. Then in verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The reason we rejoice and, and, and be happy when we suffer is because our suffering reveals God's glory. How is God... How could Peter write this? Like, how was God glorified in the suffering of his people? Suffering reveals weakness. It reveals our dependency. One of the reasons I think we resist suffering is because it publicizes our weakness. It's the reason that an Injured middle schooler refuses to cry in front of his friends. Tears mean I'm not tough. Suffering is for weaklings. We hate weakness. It's un-American. And as a Christian, you're told to rejoice in your weakness. Jesus came to the Apostle Paul and said, you should rejoice in weakness. When you're weak, then I'm strong. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul says after that, so I'll rejoice in my suffering. I don't want to be weak. I want to be strong. I want to be the hero. I want to storm the castle and slay the dragon and, and, and win the fair maiden and marry her and run off into the sunset. That's me. I want to be that. We love that story. The knight in the shining armor winning the battle against the mean dragon and winning the fair maiden. It's our story. But we're not the handsome prince. Jesus, the treasure of heaven, stormed the castle of hell and slayed the dragon of sin and death and rescued the helpless maiden and rode off into victory. But we're the maiden. We're not the prince. Suffering reveals his glory because he's the deliverer. And Jesus is the hero of this book, not Jamie. So God brings suffering to reveal his glory in delivering us. Reason four, God rests on us when we suffer. The Spirit of God rests on us. This is from verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We rejoice in suffering because when we suffer, we are blessed by the spirit of God resting on us and bringing comfort and bringing consolation. 
when you look back over your life, don't you find that the times that you are most aware of the near presence of the Lord are during the times of greatest trouble and need? Of course you do. Because Jesus' power is revealed when he calms the storm. No one appreciates air conditioning until it's hot outside. I mean, when was the last time in the dead of winter that you looked at your air conditioning unit and said, thank you, Jesus, I have air conditioning. We just don't do that. We don't appreciate things until we need them. When times of plenty come, we tend to forget the Lord until the Lord takes plenty away. And so there is great wisdom in that proverb of Proverbs 30 that says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. The Bible says the, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. It's so true. So we can rejoice in suffering because the Lord is near to us in that time. Those who are broken the most, isn't it true? They feel the nearness of God the most. And if, if you don't sense God, if you don't feel His nearness in your life, you don't feel the gentle, reassuring love of God's Holy Spirit. It's possible. You just haven't been broken. It's probable that you're trusting too much in yourself. And if you're serious about serving God and advancing the gospel on the earth, let me assure you, brokenness is coming. If you attempt to do anything for God without brokenness, He'll break you. Because at the end of the day, He's the hero. You're not the hero. He's not going to share that glory with you or me or anyone. I'm not saying we should pray for it. I mean, maybe you should. I don't know. But praying for brokenness seems to be one of the prayers that you can pray, and God will always answer that prayer. So the fourth reason for suffering, for rejoicing and suffering is that God is near. So when we do one more and then we'll wrap. Reason number five, God is faithful. Verse 19 is probably the summary verse of the whole letter. If you could encapsulate 1 Peter in one verse, it would definitely be 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, which says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Just, just stare at that verse for a moment. Just stare at it. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good. It's your memory verse for the week. And this is a great reason to rejoice. Your God is a creator. He is a faithful creator. It's interesting as I was studying this passage, this is the only time in the entire New Testament where God is called the creator. And it's related to suffering. It's related to God-ordained suffering. I think Peter means to remind us that God is in control of all things. Even when you suffer, God is in control of all things. He is creator with a capital C. He's the founder, the creator, the one from whom all things come, and he is faithful. You know, at the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19, which is my son's favorite chapter in the whole Bible, because it's, Jesus is just awesome in that passage. Jesus' picture is coming back on the clouds, and he's riding on a white horse to make war with his enemies. And he's known by two names, 
faithful and true. The word faithful, it means follow through. That which I promised, I will do. Said I'd come back, and here I am, faithful. He's a faithful creator. And we ought to entrust our souls to our faithful God. He said and promised, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. When he told the apostles in Matthew chapter 24, or Matthew chapter 28, to go into all the earth and preach the gospel to every nation, every tribe, tongue, and language. Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Great Commission. He reminded them and promised them, for I am with you even to the end of the age. You won't go alone. So next Sunday when we preach on mission and you and God wrecks your life and hears and you hear him calling you to the nations and the terrifying reality of selling all and bringing your babies to a place of foreign land he's going to leave you there. You're not going alone. And when you send your brother or your sister or your child to the nations for the advance of the gospel, you're not sending them alone. You're sending them with God's Holy Spirit. And He is the only safe place to be. Our safety we have here is a farce. The only safe place is in the arms of our Savior. All other gods will let us down. All other things we entrust our souls to will fail us and devastate us. And God will be merciful to reveal those to us. And we must entrust our souls to Him alone. What did safety do for you anyway? Was it safety on that cross? Jesus died for you. You belong to him. And we ought to entrust our souls to him. In conclusion, I want to leave you with some encouragements from Samuel Rutherford. Rutherford was a Scottish pastor in the 17th century. He had a little church in Scotland. He wrote a book on the doctrines of grace. It wasn't popular among the sort of leaders, religious leaders of the day. So they took Rutherford and they stripped him of his pastor and they threw him in prison. But Pastor Samuel's heart was still with his people back home. And so he corresponded to them with, in letters. And uh, you can get those letters today. God has been pleased to bring them to us in the modern day. They're written, you know, 17th century Scottish, so it's a little difficult to wade through, but 99 cents, you can get every single letter on Kindle. They were helpful to me, his words, in understanding Christian suffering and God-ordained Christian suffering, and so I hope that they're helpful to you. This is just some excerpts from the writings of Pastor Samuel Rutherford to his little church. I love it because they're letters. When you read them, it's to this lady, and it gives her name. And she's going through something in her house. She's going through something in her home. Maybe her kid's sick, or maybe something's going on. He's just so pastoral when he speaks. Right. Anyway, here there. If your Lord calls you to suffering, be not dismayed. There shall be a new allowance of the king for you when you come to it. The greatest temptation out of hell is to live without temptation. A pool of standing water will turn stagnant. Faith grows more with the sharp winter storm in its face. Grace withers 
without adversity. You cannot sneak quietly into heaven without a cross. Crosses form us into his image. They cut away the pieces of our corruption. Lord, cut, carve, wound. Lord, do anything to perfect your image in us and make us fit for glory. Rutherford would occasionally speak of himself. Oh, what I owe to the file, to the hammer, to the furnace of my Lord Jesus, who hath now let me see what good the wheat of Christ is that goes through his mill and his oven to be made bread for his own table. Grace tried is better than grace. It is more than grace. It is glory in its infancy. Who knows the truth of grace without a trial? Oh, how little Christ gets of us, but that which he wins with much toil and pains. And how soon would faith freeze without a cross? How many silent crosses have been laid on my back that have never a tongue to speak the sweetness of Christ as this? Why should I be surprised at the plow of my Lord that it makes deep furrows on my soul? How blind are my adversaries who sent me to a banqueting house, to a house of wine, to the lovely feasts of my Lord Jesus, and not to a prison or a place of exile. If we could just visit with God and smell heaven and our country above, our crosses would not bite if we were heavenly minded. Let's pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me by the still waters for his name's sake. His rod of correction, his staff of correction, comfort me. Our Lord and Father, let us feel the rod and staff and its gentle comfort on our souls. Let us feel and know of the caring God who in His mercy won't share His glory with another and won't leave us to ourselves as we seek after false idols and other gods. Wound, carve, and cut, great woodworker of heaven, and give us grace this morning to submit to the file and the hammer and the furnace. In Jesus' name, amen. As, we, as many of you know, at the end of the service, what we like to do is to reread our passage and give you an opportunity to reflect on what God has spoken to you through His Word. In those areas of your life where you need to confess sin and repent, where you haven't lived up to God's Word, give you an opportunity to do that. And then to rejoice in what God has done for your soul and forgiving you of those sins. You didn't sin against me, so you don't have to confess against me, but we're going to sing another song, and sometime during that song, I would encourage you to search your heart, let the Holy Spirit reveal to you where you have missed it, and to confess your sin, and to put your trust in the Lord. As we sing, you're welcome to join others at the table of the Lord over here. We're not going to do official communion this morning, but we're going to do unofficial. If you want to serve yourself, you can, you can do so. We, we, we practice open communion, which means if you're a follower of Jesus and you have good standing with your home church, then you're welcome to join us at the Lord's table. Let's stand to our feet as I read this again, as we reflect, repent, and rejoice. Cornerstone and guests, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. 
This is not something strange that is happening to you, but you should rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. And, let, and rejoice and be glad because His glory is being revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you'll be blessed because the Spirit of glory and God rests upon you. But let none of us suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For the time of judgment to begin is coming to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will become the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, dear Cornerstone and guests, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give us grace as we sing again. Bring our sins to our mind and give us the strength to confess those sins to you, to trust that you have forgiven them in Jesus' name.